we took a look at muscle fiber physiology as well, which is very interesting. So what I mean is there's generally two types of muscle fibers, fast twitch and slow twitch. And one of the things that is a hallmark of aging is a selective reduction in fast twitch fibers. And that's because it's difficult to activate them unless you're doing high force activities. Um, you're gonna activate slow twitch fibers doing almost any activity of daily living. And so they stay around. Fast twitch fibers, unless you're doing something of high force are going not be used and they're not gonna be kept around. And that's a problem because when you look at things like the need for leg strength through aging, the ability to catch yourself from a fall, um, these things are incredibly important. If you don't have fast twitch fibers, you don't have the speed to get your foot out in front of you on time and you don't have the eccentric strength to stop the fall from happening. And so if you look across again, the aging literature, they're, they're very clear about the importance of maintaining strength and, and fast twitch fibers over time. So we know that this is an important distinction here of role. And people will often talk about, okay, how much of that um, is genetically determined? Can I change my fiber type? And the answer there is, is resoundingly yes. And can I change it with exercise? And the answer is absolutely you can. And then the next question is well, how much? So now again, we're gonna see an order of magnitude. In general, without going too far down a, an area that maybe we can save for, for later, um, each one of your muscles in your body has a different percentage of fast twitch and slow twitch. For example, your calf. Uh, if you look at your soleus, which is kind of the smaller one that goes in the back, that's generally mostly slow twitch, typically 80% or so slow twitch. Um, the gastroc, which is the other one right next to it, so if you were to point your toe next to your face and that part that kind of flexes out in the middle, pops out, that's your gastroc. That is almost the inverse. So it's generally 80% fast twitch, maybe 20% slow twitch. Um, generally anything anti-postural or postural rather or anti-gravity, uh, spinal erectors, things that are meant to keep you up or moving all day are going to be slow twitch and things like your hamstrings, which are for explosion are gonna be fast twitch. Well, we biopsy the quad in these individuals and in that muscle, it's generally about 50-50, fast twitch, slow twitch, as, as a really broad number. Well, one of the things that we found was in the non-exerciser, it was almost textbook what you would predict. It was about 50% or so slow twitch, a little bit of percentage of fast twitch, and then a, about 20% of what are these called hybrid fibers, which are a hallmark of inactivity. All right, great. In the exerciser, it was about 95% slow twitch. And so it's extremely clear, again, I don't know if maybe their set point was a little bit higher towards that and the non-exerciser De, you know, devolve down to his place or the other one, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you're going from 40% slow twitch in one case to 95% slow twitch in another case. It shows you that the, the, the limits of physiological adaptation are darn near boundless given enough exposure. And in this case, 35 years of extremely consistent training and his muscle morphology was completely different than his identical twin with the exact same DNA. Those are two beautiful examples of people doing endurance work for a number of years and what that gives them in terms of benefits and functionality. Has the opposite experiment been done or observed where somebody just weight lifted or just sprinted for a number of years? Uh, I don't know that there's a identical twin uh, control. That's no, a little- I too, wish we had too, a third twin. Too, too much to ask for, right? Triplets, okay, so triplets out there, um, if you're exercising in different ways, or people who have triplets, maybe you assign one kid to be a runner, one ah. kid to be a weightlifter, and the other one to be sedentary. Please yeah. don't do experiments like that. But the expectation, as I understand it, would be that the person that sprints or that does heavy squats, explosive work, would then have more fast twitch muscle fibers in their quad and their non-exercising counterpart would have fewer. That that would make sense. But what happens if you assess the, the endurance level in somebody who's just done strength training or just sprinted? Yep, so we don't have those data specifically. There's We're actually just starting to have studies come out on lifelong strength trainers. And there's actually a very good reason for this, uh, which is a whole story we can get into. But the, the quick answer is, we don't have a lot of people who've been lifting weights for 30 or plus years. We have a whole swath of people who've been doing endurance training for that long. Is that because fewer people have been weight training or are the weight trainers all dead? You gotta go back to the 1953, 1954. You had two major things happen that changed the entire course of exercise physiology and exercise science and really exercise as we know it. It's important to understand the history of our field. A lot of the questions I get 
are based on false assumptions of what exercise can and can't do. As an example, we, uh, questions like momentum. Should I use momentum or, or that's cheating, right? Or it doesn't work, uh, it compromises my results. It's actually totally untrue. There are excellent reasons when you should use momentum when you lift. There are reasons when you should not. It is sometimes very beneficial to go fast with the exercise repetitions. Sometimes very slow and controlled is better. Any question I get, in fact, I'm very infamous for always responding with, it depends. The reason I say it depends is it depends on the goal. When you're training for speed or power or muscular endurance, the answer to some of these very common questions differs. What people fail to realize is they think they're asking the right question because they don't understand this history, what's being planted in your brain subconsciously is driving that question. And it's not necessarily the right one. So if we walk through that a little bit, you'll see what that field has led to you, why you think certain things matter when they actually don't, or maybe your assumptions are incorrect, and then exactly what to do about them.